Hello, welcome to this edition of using profit annuities and self-canceling installment sales. And in the memory of Jimmy Buffett, we'll be trying to put some humor in as well. So hi, I'm Alan Gassman. Jerry Hesch is in the process of joining us, at least uh, audio. We probably won't have video on Jerry. Um, I'm touched by the death of Jimmy Buffett. I didn't see it coming. He was 76 years old and a party role model for a lot of people in my generation. At the end of this presentation, before we talk more about Estate View, I'll be sharing some of my favorite Jimmy Buffett albums and songs. In case you're not a Jimmy Buffett fan, so maybe you could become one, it's not too late. So today's presentation is on private annuities and self-canceling installment notes. A lot of you will be watching by video replay. If you're watching by video replay, go to the right hand corner, bottom corner, uh, and click on the settings symbol there, and then click on 1080 PhD. And you don't have to be a PhD in computers to do that, but whenever you go to a video and you wanna see better quality, go to uh, that. If you came in through CPA Academy, you have to answer three of the four polling questions. We've really dubbing them down for you guys. Uh, so you should uh, learn from the polling questions and answer them. If you don't get them answered or you miss them because you were taking your cat for a walk or something, just send us an email and we'll appear, we'll appeal to the credit accreditation gods and get you accepted. Uh, if you came in through our website, you won't get credit unless you're a Florida lawyer. Send us an email, ask for the credit, and we will make sure that you get it. If you have questions, go to the upside down pyramid, send upside down, type in the question, and we will try to answer it. I believe one of your attachments today is the Barbie report, which came out on Thursday. Uh, we talk about the Barbie trust and Barbie's estate planning. So you definitely don't want to miss that, especially if you have trouble sleeping at night. Next week, I am going to be here with Ed Gordon. He is a very, very bright estate and tax planning professional from New York City. And he and I are gonna talk about life insurance, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then the following week, we're gonna talk about his favorite planning techniques, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Later on, I'll tell you how to get a free uh, beta test subscription to Estate View if you're interested in it. And before we even start, I'm gonna try the first polling question to get it out of the way. Professor Jerry Hash, who is my co-presenter today. A, did we launch the polling question, by the way? We're gonna launch this polling question. Okay, hold on to your hats. Professor Jerry Hash, A, is an esteemed law professor. In my opinion, the most influential law professor in the estate and estate tax planning arena. And most of my colleagues who have know Jerry agree with that. B, he explained the tax law to President Gerald Ford on a number of occasions and got complimented by President Ford. C, he is the director of the Notre Dame Tax and Estate Planning Institute. D, he still has his original Triumph convertible and a Triumph motorcycle, which he drives regularly. Neither of them have air conditioning. Or E, all of the above. And by the way, if you wanna see a funny skit, watch Chevy Chase play the part of Gerald Ford on Saturday Night Live in the 70s. You'll just fall over when you see it. All right, Treasure, did we get enough answers? Super. Also at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna to talk to Jerry about the Notre Dame Tax Institute. Basically, don't miss it or don't miss subscribing to it. It's September 20 through September 22nd. It's gonna be the latest, greatest in a lot of original ways. So, Jerry, are you here? Are you with us? I'm here, can you hear me? I hear you great, and you can see the, the you can see the screen. I can see the screen, and uh, I can see you. Excellent, excellent. 
So Jerry, do you want, how, how do you introduce the topic of private annuities and self-canceling installment notes to your students? Okay, well, most of the time, uh, the estate planning profession uses private annuities and self-canceling installment notes for someone in very poor health who's expected to die within a reasonable period of time. Uh, the reason is that your rights to future payments terminate upon your death. And so if, for example, if you, you have, uh, if you're 70 years old, and you have a $1 million asset, uh, and you basically transfer it to a grantor trust in exchange for a self-canceling installment note that has a million dollar value, or a right to future annuity payments that have a $1 million value. It's a transfer for full and adequate consideration, and therefore there's no gift and there will be no state tax inclusion. The key is the value for someone age 70, as an example, assumes using the standard mortality tables that an individual age 70 will live exactly 15 years. Therefore, the right to future payments assumes you're going to receive future payments for the next 15 years. And as long as uh, you know, as long as it's a transfer for full and adequate consideration, when it cancels, there's no estate tax inclusion. So what people do is they basically uh, have somebody who is in extremely poor health, is not expected to live beyond a year or two or two or, and they basically use the standard mortality tables say we're going to issue a we're going to for your transfer of a million dollar asset we're going to give you an annuity or a self-canceling installment note worth a million dollars it's it's based on the assumption you're going to live 15 years and there's no estate tax inclusion when it transfers so what people do is they know that the individual is going to die within a year or two so they assume the standard mortality tables and basically uh, for in those situations, the person dies early, like in it within a year, and the IRS challenges it and says you never intended to uh, have the individual live that long, and therefore we're basically going to say you made a gift for gift tax purposes. And these are factual situations, and the, and the courts have litigated. There's a whole slew of these cases. And it's a subjective factual determination. And half the time the taxpayer wins, half the time the taxpayer loses. Okay. Most people do not use private annuities for healthy individuals or self canceling installment notes for healthy individuals. And what Alan and I are going to show you today is we have a healthy individual who's expected to live a long period, a long and full life. And we're going to show you the estate and gift tax advantages of using a skin or a private annuity for healthy individuals. And we assume they're actually going to live a long period of time. And that's, and that is what we're going to do. And I'm going to turn it back to Alan. Thank you, Jerry. So, I know we have a lot of laymen on this webinar, so I want to just take have you look at this slide 20 that I have up here. I have a taxpayer age 70 on the left, and on the right, I have an irrevocable trust that can be for that person's spouse, present or future, descendants, charity, but that trust is set up to be what we call disregarded for income tax purposes. So the income and deductions of that trust for income tax purposes go on the taxpayer's Form 1040 income tax return. And what the taxpayer does with that trust is not considered to be a transaction 
for income tax purposes while the taxpayer is alive. So I have a million dollars of Apple stock. I'm confident that it's going to go through the roof and be worth $5 million in 10 years. And I have an estate tax issue. If I keep that Apple stock, then the $5 million of value is going to be in my estate for estate tax purposes. So I could sell that million dollars of stock to an irrevocable trust. So I would typically put a seed capital gift of about $100,000 into that trust. And then I would transfer the Apple stock to the trust. And here's what the trust can do back. At the very top, and this is, these are based on January rates, which are a little different now, but still a three-year note. The trust owes me a million dollars on a three-year note. Interest at 4.5%. No penalty for prepayment, so I could do a nine-year note at 3.85%. I could do a, a over nine-year note at 3.84%. Now, they're a tiny bit higher now. You're still under 4%. So I sell the Apple stock for a 4% note. The trust owes me $40,000 a year. It pays me an Apple stock each year worth $40,000. And when the Apple stock is worth $5 million in year five, I still just have a $1 million note, and the trust has four and a half, five million dollars worth of assets. They're out of my estate. And then when the trust sells those assets, I pay the income tax on the four million dollar capital gain, which reduces my estate more, unless I toggle off grant or trust status, which we could talk about another hour. But what Jerry points out is the client says, hey Alan, um, thanks for setting up that note last year. I'm owed $10 million on the note, and I have a lot of other assets. When I die, is that note going to be subject to estate tax? And the answer is yes, it is, probably at a discount, but it will still be subject to estate tax. Well, the client says, well, you know, I just got a bad diagnosis, and I've got a four-year, five-year life expectancy. I'm hoping for a miracle in medical science, but most likely it won't happen. Well, we can convert that $10 million 4% note to a self-canceling installment note. Most planners believe that it should balloon within life expectancy. The standard life expectancy of a 70-year-old is just over 14 years. If we use the standard tables, and we set this up as a self-canceling installment note, the interest rate will have to be 8.923%. So if you live more than eight or nine years, it backfires. But if you're fortunate enough to die within five, six, seven years, that $10 million note is not subject to estate tax. From the years I started to practice in 1984, through when the IRS litigated the Davidson case just a few handful of years ago, I think most of us thought that you could use the standard life expectancy tables for a self-canceling installment note unless somebody had more than a 50% chance of dying within a year of entering into the, into the arrangement. But the IRS said, no, you can't use our standard mortality tables for somebody who's sick. You can still do that for a private annuity, but not for a self-canceling installment note. So there are daredevils who still do this with people who are really sick but have a two, three-year life expectancy using a self-canceling installment note. But now we'll talk about the private annuity. The client says, Alan, I just got a bad diagnosis. Uh, I've got three or four years. And by the way, when a client calls you with a diagnosis, just Google. ABC disease, age 71, age 70, 
life expectancy and up will come all sorts of articles on life expectancy, then you can call a doctor and uh, be more sure. But the private annuity would involve my client giving the $10 million, let's say, of Apple stock or assets to the trust or converting a $10 million note to a payment arrangement for life. And if the client wants equal annual payments for life, in January, it would have been $104,000 for every million of consideration. So the client puts in $10 million of Apple stock gets back a million and four, uh, uh, just over a million dollars of Apple stock each year. And then in year two, the client dies and there's a lot of Apple stock in there and the annuity is not subject to estate tax. Now we're gonna mention later that when you do a private annuity, you wanna do it with a disregarded trust, but the IRS says that trust has to have a very high value. And that's called the probability of exhaustion test. A lot of reputable planners don't believe that the IRS regulation is valid because it, it is it is crazy because it assumes that you're going to live to 110, which is not a reasonable assumption for most of us. So that's what this presentation today is about, how planners can use a self-canceling installment note, how planners can use a private annuity as JIC. I normally only use them when people are not going to live very long or we don't think they will. But as Jerry points out, if my client has 50 million of Apple stock, puts it in the trust in exchange for receiving 5 million a year. And if my client spends 2 million a year on income okay. taxes, and then another 2 million a year on living expenses and gives a million dollars a year to charity, I don't ever have to worry about estate taxes because he's going to get 5 million a year, he's going to spend it and then when he dies there's not going to be any estate tax or even any federal estate tax return to be filed. Jerry, anything to add to that? I think we've pretty much laid a good foundation here. I mean, in other words, there's two reasons you would use skins or private annuities. The first situation is because the standard mortality tables assume someone age 70 is going to live 15 years, so you get a deferred payment obligation on the assumption you're going to get 15 years of payments. And for someone in poor health, it's a factual determination as, as to whether we can ignore the mortality tables and say, you only expected the individual to live two years, therefore you made a gift of, let's say the right to two years of payments on a $1 million annuity is $150,000. So they would say the difference of 850 is a gift for gift tax purposes. Uh, anytime you have somebody with a diagnosis of uh, limited life expectancy, it is a factual determination and the bottom line is you better have good medical records to show that there's a probability the individual is not going to die within the next year or two. Um, and, and that's, but what we're going to show you today after, we, after Alan just, you know, Alan just gave you a nice summary. If you want to do this for a, for someone who's not, uh, someone in poor health, we're going to show you that how about doing both an annuity or a skin for a healthy individual who we expect to live a long period of time? And under what circumstances that might be a nice thing? But, all right. All right. So let's go to polling question number two. By the way, polling question number one, the answer was E, all of the above. So Jerry has quite a track record here. So speak. Well, let, let me when I was with the Treasury Department and the IRS in the early 1970s, we were working on 
what were eventually found its way into the OID rules in the 1984 Act. And we had a meet, we had a meeting with the uh, exe executive branch of government, and uh, and that's and basically my role was try to explain a very technical area called the OID rules in an understandable manner. And because I had an ability to explain things without getting technical, the president said, hey, I actually, for the first time, understood what you guys were talking about. That had okay. to feel very good. Did did Gerald Ford, how, how long would Gerald Ford sit and listen to an explanation of the tax law? Well, the previous meeting, he got bored because it was all the, all, all the technical geeks. Uh, and, the, and so that's why they brought me along. But would he would he sit an hour or 15 minutes or how, did he did he take notes? Did he pay attention? Actually, I, I, th I think that uh, our first meeting was uh, it, it lasted a, about an hour. Wow. It was a, yeah. That's very neat. All right. So, Treasurer, okay. do we are we, on we also have a lot of things in common, both. Gerald Ford and I were University of Michigan grads. So oh, like and did you mention that to him? Of course. I didn't, I didn't. Wow, that's neat. All right, so Treasurer, are we on this polling question? Okay, so we're done. So if you answered all of the above to the fact that Notre Dame Tax and Estate Planning Institute, my favorite institute, will be September 20 to 22, you can attend live or you can order the materials and videos with credit. And it is filled with estate and tax planning superheroes. I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss it this year. I'll be in Italy, but we're gonna talk more about it in a little while. So Jerry, I just wanted to uh, mention to the attendees that the income tax rates and the 7520 rates are coming up so especially if you're going to do an installment sale, a private annuity, a self-canceling installment note, it's more advantageous to do it before the rates go up further. And we're certainly uh, at a trend here. Sorry, I pushed the wrong way. We're certainly at a trend here where they are going up. It was the 7520 rate, which dictates a lot of these measurements with private annuities and self-canceling installment notes, was at 3.6% in September of 2022. One year later, 5%. And the long-term applicable federal rate was at 3.12% a year ago. Now it's at 4.15%, but you can use the lowest of this year, I mean, this month or the last two months. So you could close a transaction in September and use 2.94, I'm sorry, 3.94% as your base interest rate, and then you add a premium interest rate when you do a self-canceling installment note. Probably after the hour, at the request of a client, I'm gonna go over this chart, which gives a practical planning scenario where one, one spouse will set up a spousal limited access trust, for the health, education, maintenance, and support of the other spouse. The other spouse can redirect where the trust assets go on death. And one of, one of Jerry's hypotheticals that we'll get to pretty soon is that husband has $20 million of investments growing at 7%. He puts them into the slat. He contributes $12 million as a gift and he sells eight million for a lifetime annuity. And that annuity gives the, the, spout, the couple all the income they need during his lifetime. And whatever that grows to is out of his estate. They pay the income tax on the trust. When he dies, she can live on the trust. So we're gonna go over those numbers. At the same time, typically the other spouse is setting up an irrevocable trust for descendants to get her half of the assets or her share of the assets out of the estate. And of course it could be a same sex marriage. So that's why we call them spouse one and spouse two. 
uh, uh, we don't, I don't normally call them husband or wife anymore, but in this world, Jerry, with private annuities and skins, do the IRS tables know or care what the sex of a person is? No, they're gender neutral. Right, right. So we need to, you know, it, it, we need to get used to uh, using spouse one and spouse two instead of husband and wife. So Jerry, what's your first example that you would like to go through? Okay. Uh, a self-canceling installment note for a healthy individual. And the, the, key, the key here is when we do a regular installment sale to a grant or trust, and if we use the long-term AFR for September, which is 4.19%, uh, we basically, the individual is getting 4.19% of annual income, but the problem is it's a sale to a grant or a trust. So even though it is a completed transfer to a separate taxpayer for the gift and estate tax purposes, so that the trust is not included in the grantor's gross estate, for income tax purposes, a, a fiction is created for income tax purposes only, and that fiction is that the grantor is deemed for income tax purposes only to own all of the trust assets. So let's take a simple situation. Let's suppose an individual has an asset worth a million dollars that's producing, say, $60,000 a year of income. And they sell it to a grantor trust for a million dollar installment note at 4% interest. So what that means is every year, the trust earns $60,000 and the trust only has to pay $40,000 to the grantor's interest on the note. And since the trust owns the property for gift and estate tax purposes, the trust keeps the spread. So every year, the trust has $60,000 of income coming in, pays out $40,000, and every year the trust increases by $20,000. Now, the problem is it's a grantor trust. So the grantor is getting a $40,000 interest payment, but for income tax purposes, the grantor has to report $60,000 of taxable income. And if it's a 40% income tax rate on 60,000, that's like, what's 40% of 60,000, Alan? 24,000. Good, thank you. Uh, so all of a sudden, the grantor is getting $40,000 and has to pay $24,000 of income taxes. So the grantor is netting $16,000. So the grantor says, wait a minute. And you're showing me that the asset, the income in the trust is going to keep building up over the years because it's going to retain uh, the extra 20000 I don't like that. And so basically, is there a way I can get more money from the trust? And the answer is you can increase the interest rate because the AFR is the minimum rate. And under the Internal Revenue Code, there's guidance that says you can have an interest rate that is five percentage points greater than the AFR. So wait a minute. So if I increase the interest rate on the installment note to say from 4% to say uh, uh, nine, six or seven percent, that pays for the risk premium for a skin. So we're basically increasing the interest rate on the note so the grantor can get a little bit more money back. And if you basically go over the tables, you would see that if I increase the interest rate by 5%, which the statute allows you to do, I have this self-canceling feature. So, uh, but the, remember, the grantor is healthy. 
and we expect them to live a long period of time. However, there's a possibility the individual might die during the no term. And since we're not doing this, so what we're doing is the individual is going to pay, is going to consume all of the extra money uh, in one way or another. So as long as we have a healthy individual, we can increase the interest rate. We can make this note self-canceling. We hope this never happens, but if the individual dies during the term of the note, it becomes an estate tax windfall. And because he was healthy, there's nothing for the IRS to challenge. So we have an example here, an individual age 70 has under the mortality tables the IRS uses for skins, an individual age 70 has a 16 year life expectancy. And if we were going to do an installment sale, say of a million dollars at the AFR of 5%, that would be 50,000 a year. So if I increase the interest rate from 5% to 10.01%, guess what? If the individual happens to die unexpectedly, which we hope never happens, it becomes an estate tax windfall. And you can basically, so basically all you have to do is add an additional interest rate and that covers the risk premium. So let's look at the table, the next slide. Hold on, I'm okay. trying to get there. That's why I'm not in charge of the slides oh, no. you are. So you can blame it on me. Let me see. Right. Okay, there we go. All right. So here, here's the point is, if, now the key here is the individual is going to use that $100,000 a year of interest to pay the income taxes on the grant or trust income and consume the rest. So you see every year, the individual gets the $100,000 of interest payments, spends it either by paying the extra income taxes because he's got to pay income taxes on grant or trust income or personal consumption. And in the event that he unexpectedly dies any time within the next 16 years, that million dollars is canceled. Got it. So that's it. And, and that's it. Now, the, here, here's the point is, you can also, so basically, how do we value a self-counseling installment note? Okay. And here, here's the key, is an individual age 70 has a life expectancy of, say, 16 years. Okay. Now, so, Every, so if, so if we had a, suppose we had a self amortizing installment note for a million dollar asset that was going to pay uh, 151,000 a year. I'm sorry. Suppose we had a, uh, okay. So basically you would look at that and you have to take into account two factors. One is the present value of all the future payments. And the second factor is the probability of them surviving one year or two years. And so what you see here is you take two factors into account. And when you determine the value of this asset, it comes out to be, uh, so if I, so basically it really for, for, Income tax for for actuarial purposes, it has a hundred. It has a value of a million. But in this situation, if you take into account only the present value and not the probability of survival, it's worth 1.2 million. So the one point. So the 200,000 is the risk premium. So if we did. So basically, what we do is. If I have a million dollar asset, I can increase the principal to 1.2 million, which covers the risk premium if it's principal, or alternatively, 
I can basically determine the two hundred thousand dollars extra in the increase in the interest payments. So because the individual is healthy, this becomes something that is because they don't always want to receive they just the low AFR one. There are reasons they want more money. Okay, let's go to a, the, let's go to the third polling question just to get these over with. Uh, is this the one you're showing the Labor Day one, Treasure? What's that? Okay. Would you like to beta test to State View software, which we'll show you in a little while? A, yes, and I know how. B, yes, but I don't know how, which means we'll send you an email telling you how. C. Can you please repeat the question? Or D, sorry, the phone number you have called is no longer in service. Treasurer, let me know how we're doing here. Okay, and what's the most popular answer? Okay, the most popular answer is sorry, the number you have dialed is no longer in service. Well, that there's there's no better way for a speaker to be rewarded than by apathy from his audience. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Now let me let me point something out. When we are proposing complicated uh, estate planning techniques, and we're using acronyms and we're talking in general terms, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So what a state view is actually doing is doing a financial illustration of the financial impact of the different techniques. So when you're explaining the technique to the client, it allows you to do it in an understandable manner by using numerical examples to illustrate how the estate planning benefits are actually achieved. So it's just a communications it's a, a communication technique that will develop your skills and how to communicate very complicated estate planning techniques in an understandable manner. Okay, so here's the what I went what I did was I went to a stateview.link, L I N K. I told it that my email address is test, T E S T, at <laughs> test.com. I told it my password was test. And then I pulled it up. I went to the calculator uh, place and I clicked for self-canceling installment notes. And what it starts with is it tells me that the 75-20 rate in September where we are right now is 5%. It starts with a 70-year-old, but I can toggle it up or down to the age I want to see. It tells me that for a 70-year-old, the life expectancy is 15.4 years. Now, I'm 64, and it will tell me that my life expectancy is 19.8 years. And then it selects a 15-year term, but I can move it up to 19, which is probably the wisest thing. And then it asks me, what year does my client die? And we'll come back to that. It will give me the history of the applicable federal rate here if I want to look it up for a different month. It's going to give me the lowest of this month and the last two months, which is 3.94%. And uh, I'm assuming that the assets that I give to the trust in exchange for this skin are growing at 7%. That I'm going to make a $1 million gift to the trust, and then I'm going to put $10 million of Apple stock or cash, whatever it is, into the trust in exchange for a promissory note. So across the top here, it, it says, yes, you're doing a 19-year term. You're 64 years old. You're doing it on one life only. Million dollar seed capital gift, $10 million value in exchange for the skin, 75-20 rate, 5%. Here's the AFR. So the interest rate premium that my trust needs to pay me in exchange for the fact that this cancels on my death is 3.547%. So 
So the total interest rate, this plus the 3.94, 7.5047% on $10 million, that's an annual payment of 750,470. And then it shows me this spreadsheet. Now I hit fit full. And by the way, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna change my pen here so you can follow me better. I forgot you can't see my per my cursor. So I'm gonna hit, well, it won't let me hit anything. So I'm gonna get back out of that. All right, some other time. Um, so at the bottom of the screen, I hit fit full and the spreadsheet fits, but see how small it is? So I go to show every other year. Now the spreadsheet's bigger. And the spreadsheet shows me, I start with 11 million, it grows by 7%, it makes a payment, it has an end value, it's going up in value, it's going, but it's having to make the payment. And if my client dies in year 21, there's really very tiny tax savings. It's really backfired. But if my client dies in year nine, there's $9 million in this trust. No, I'm sorry, there's $23 million in this trust and the note goes away. So there are significant estate tax savings, 4 million three. Jerry, anything to add at this point? Yeah. Remember that one of the reasons a healthy individual wants a higher interest rate on the note is because they have to pay all the income taxes and they don't want to, they want to mitigate that. So you increase the interest rate on right. the note. And so the key, the key is, even though if you live your full term and it never canceled, it's neutral because they need, they want the extra money, they have the ability to get an estate planning windfall if they happen to die during the no term. Right. So the fact that if they live their full life expectancy, it's neutral. The key is they want the extra money and a higher interest rate. And therefore, if as, lo as long as it covers the risk premium on the skin, we throw it in. Right, right. So uh, just a couple of techie things. If you're a techie, if I click on alter summary columns, then I can tell the computer what columns I wanna see in the summary. I don't have to see all of them. I can just see some of them across the top there. And then also the uh, spreadsheet, I can click here to export it to an Excel spreadsheet. And I can also click here and have fewer columns in the spreadsheet. So it can be pretty much customized for you with the uh, fewer columns. So the next thing I can do, Jerry, and I'm gonna go back and I wanna show uh, all the columns. But the next thing I can do is, first of all, I can save this one and hit duplicate. So now across the top, you see two of them, and then I can change something, whatever that might be. It might be to say, what happens if they die in year 12? So now the first one's showing me the results if I die in year 19, the second one, if I die in year 11. But let's do another one. Now this is the Wait, third one. Go ahead. The key. You, most of the time when people do a proposals, they'll assume one static set of numbers. Here, you have the ability to change the assumptions. And so therefore, you can work with the client and show them, client says, well, what happens if it earns more than this? Or what happens if it earns less than this? Or what happens if the appreciation and value is this different? And you can basically show the client all sorts of Working with the client, you can basically show all the different situations, which basically means that the client can then work with you in how to design the plan to accommodate the client's needs. 
Right. Yes, sir. Now, for skin number five, I'm going to click on advanced in the top left hand side. And now there's more choices. And one choice would be instead of giving 10 million of Apple stock, how about if I put that Apple stock in an LLC and a couple of months later, I just sell the 99% non voting member interest in the LLC for the note? Let's say I take a 25% discount. So I'll click here on the discount rate to 25%. And then you immediately see that what's going to be left in this trust is a lot more because the payments are a lot less. The estate tax savings. When you compare the, the third and the fourth, I mean the fourth and the fifth grat is 500,000. And then another thing, and I think this is going to be really pleasing to a lot of you planners out there is, you know, client comes in, a lot of times it's a business. And what they're telling you is the business is going up 7% a year and it pays a $300,000 a year dividend. So, what you can do here is put, okay, $300,000 a year dividend in addition to 7% growth. I'll just click here to 300,000. So that's going to tell me much more tax savings than a lot of us have been able to project uh, before. And then another thing that, so I'll, I'll call that duplicate. That's, that's number five. And then number six, may be, well, what if I do a two life skin? What if I don't want it to expire until the death of the surviving spouse? So I click on two at the bottom left-hand side. And now I've got another uh, situation shown. So that, that's also what you're able to do. Now to save this at this point, you click on general explanation at the top right-hand side. And if you want, you could get an explanation for all six of these. And then I like to click on PowerPoint presentation, uh, put the client's name, Jerry Hash, hit submit. And it's just prepared five PowerPoints. And let's just look at one of them. PowerPoint opens up. There's the client's name there. And then it explains the exact numbers we use so that you can go back later. It explains how the skin works. And then it gives you the spreadsheet that you saw there. And it tells you the tax savings. Do so you that, mean that within five or 10 minutes, you can have prepared an entire financial illustration, a PowerPoint illustration as well. How much time do you think that would save if you had to do this all from scratch? It, Jerry, we're finding that it saves six or seven hours. Uh, you know, in the old days, you would have to go to a different one software program to get the, the interest rate. And then you would have to go to Excel and load in the uh, spreadsheet. So I'm saying five or six hours. What What's your guess? More like 10. Yeah, and, and this allows you to do more. It also allows you to, to just send the software to the client and say, you figure out what you want to do. It, it, get, it It's more interesting to the client. Now, also we're working on and, and have to some extent a planner's checklist, a general explanation for the client. Um, Wait a minute. A general explanation, you know, you, usually when you do a proposal, you got to send a planning letter out uh, with the, with, which describes the proposal in, in, in like a word format. So what is this general explanation that you're talking about? The, we're, we're going to have two explanations. The, ge the uh, general explanation will be a fairly robust letter explaining the whole concept and then explaining the numbers of the particular skin you're looking at doing. The short explanation will be a much more Reader's Digest type of, of version for that. The plan so, so do you mean, using a state view, you can generate all, a financial analysis, you can generate a 
PowerPoint presentation to use to explain it. And third, you can give them a written explanation of the whole thing, all in one little thing. That's it. That is it. That's why I, I don't know about you, Jerry. I don't know how much time you've spent on the software, but I'm learning a lot about, you know, it's probably like in the old days when you sailed a boat, you'd look at the star and try to figure out where the wind was coming from. Now you've got GPS. This is really going to be, you know, video GPS for the estate planner because you can really understand and, and show the numbers better. Let, let's go ahead and do the last polling question and then we'll cover private annuities. Um, the polling question is for Labor Day, would you like to A, play with estate view software, or B, become a better estate tax planner, or C, meet your favorite musical and or sports hero, other than Jimmy Buffett, and then D, all of the above. Now, I know this is a really difficult question. It's early on the Saturday in most places in the United States, but I know you can do this one. Treasure, which one is the winner? All of the above. Very nice. By the way, I'll be at Skipper's Smokehouse in uh, Tampa uh, Monday, Sunday night at 7 p.m. to see Will Johns, Eric Clapton's nephew, play Eric Clapton and Will John songs. If you've never been to Skipper's Smokehouse near Lutes, Florida, you are in for a treat sitting outside in the Skipper Dome, they call it. All right. But now to the less important things. Jerry, you want to have you want to say anything about the private annuity? I've got about seven minutes here to 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 show well, how a private annuity might work. Here, here's the key. Many go you can go to the private annuity thing, but I can explain it in about two minutes. You have an individual who has got say. Uh, $25 million of investment assets, okay? And you could say, I, you know, we can put all $25 million in these estate planning techniques. You can retain nothing. And the individual is going to say to you, uh-uh, I'm not putting everything in, in a trust for the benefit of my descendants, and I got nothing left. Typically, an individual is going to like maximize out their gift tax exemptions. And remember the gift tax exemptions are going to go down in 2026. And they're going to, out of $25 million, they're going to say, I'm going to retain, I'm going to only do 15 million in your estate plans. And I'm going to retain 10 million in my own name. Because I want the financial security of knowing I got $10 million sitting there for the rest of my life if I ever need it. I don't want it in trust for the benefit of my spouse and my descendants. I want it now. So basically, what that means is out of the 25 billion, they do the estate plan with 15 million and they retain a $10 million asset. Why do they want to retain the $10 million asset? It's because I want to make sure I got the income from the 10 million for the rest of my life, even if I live to age 100 or 105. So if they retain that $10 million of assets, only giving away 15 out of their 25, that means 10 million is exposed to estate tax. And they kept the 10 million for the sole purposes they want the income from it for the rest of their life without having to depend on the trusts. Okay. We do, it's simple. They want the income from 10 million so you use the 10 million to purchase an annuity from the trust that will provide them with an annual annuity for the rest of their life. And guess what? It accomplishes their financial objective of knowing that I'm going to get the income from the 10 million for the rest of my life. But because you do it as an annuity for a healthy individual, when they die, the entire 10 million is not included in the gross estate. It's that simple because nobody is going to give everything away in one of their estate planning techniques. They're going to want to retain a certain amount of income producing assets for the financial security. So they do a private annuity and get that financial security 
with a private annuity from their family trust. That's that's the key. Perfect, Jerry. I just want to point out, and I apologize to the audience and to you too, Jerry. This is a 90-minute presentation. So we have six polling questions. So Treasure, you're going to have to re, we're going to have to do two of the polling questions again when we get there. And hooray, we don't have to rush so much. We've got 30, oh. 34 minutes. Uh, well, that's because of your short-term memory loss. Now. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're right. I forgot the first half hour, so we'll just do it again. All okay. right. So, so. So we can actually. We can actually repeat some of the stuff because when you hear it the first time, it might not sink in. So we can basically go through it again and, and explain it more. And so it makes a little bit more sense. Well, not only that, but you had a really, really good example here that we can go over. The and, private annuity one. Yeah, the private annuity one. So, and I made it into a little chart this morning. It's not completely done, but here it is. You've got spouse one, spouse two. They have $30 million of investment assets generating a 7% rate of return. That's $2.1 million a year. $2.1 million a year. And then Jerry, do you, for future reference, do you have an in income tax rate? And, then they, and do you know what these people spend a year? Well, uh, I always assume they're in the highest marginal income tax bracket, which is 37% for federal purposes, and uh, and we can put in like 5% in, in most states, uh, or you know, or 0% if they're in Florida or Texas, uh, or we can put in 13.3% if they're in California. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe, or 9% if they're in Massachusetts. In other words, you always have to take into account the when because we use grantor trusts that you're going to have to pay the income taxes on the trust income without having access to that income. And that we call that the burden because when you pay the income taxes, that reduces your remaining retained wealth. So we have to take into account the income taxes. One of the nice things about a state view is there's four factors that contribute to wealth depletion. One is valuation discounts. The second is what we call financial leverage. I have an asset that producing a 6% rate of return and I sell it to the trust for a promissory note paying 4%. So the trust gets the spread. The third factor is that if I sell a million dollar asset to a trust, I don't own the asset anymore. All I have is a million dollar note that can't appreciate in value. And the trust has a million dollar asset. And if it appreciates in value, the trust owns it. So it's the appreciation. So that third factor is what we call freezing your assets by freezing it at the note. And the fourth factor is what is the impact of the grantor having to pay all the income taxes? And as the assets in the income producing assets in the trust build up over time, that burn can be very significant. Right. Okay, so that I really like what you do here. The the spouse one makes a twelve million dollar gift to a spousal limited access trust. Well, wait, wait, let's okay. go back. Okay. They have 30 million of assets, husband and wife or spouse one and spouse two, each have $12 million. So they basically say each of them make 12 million gifts out of the 30 million, that is 24 million, and all you're left with is $6 million. And the client says, uh-uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. So basically make one gift and be left with say, 30, 28 million is a, or no, 18 million is a lot more financially viable. Absolutely. Much easier on the reptile brain as well. 
Okay, so you want to guide us through the funding of a spousal limited access trust by the first spouse for the second spouse? Okay. So, 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 so basically, the first spouse funds a trust for the benefit of my spouse and my descendants. And we call that a SLAT. That's an acronym to stand for Spousal Limited Access Trust. So essentially, spouse one, or I always use H and W, Alan. So H can be Henrietta and W can be Walter. That's true. All right. All right. So basically, so H funds that trust with a $12 million taxable gift. So H and W have now retained $18 million of the $30 million. He then basically sells $10 million or, or no, don't know how much, I think $8 million. $8 million, right. $8 million to that trust for a private annuity that pays $657,000 a year for life. So here's, here's the situation. We have one trust, okay, which has the $12 million gift and the eight million it uh, has for issuing the eight million private annuity. So the trust has twenty million, and spouse one still has ten million dollars. Okay. Yeah. And so now the question becomes: If spouse one dies first, you know, no big deal. But spouse one, H, might be concerned, what happens if my spouse dies before me? Okay. So essentially, let, let's look at the two different hypotheticals. Okay. Yeah. Or, okay. All right. So... Should we go to step three? Husband dies. Yeah. Oh, so oh, you, oh, so you did it in a uh, slide presentation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen the slides. No, I wanted to surprise you. All right. And they Could were only done five minutes before we started. Explanation. What's that? The textual explanation I wrote. Yeah. Right. There you go. Okay, let's go. So go back to the textual point. Okay. Now remember. So the first thing is he creates an irrevocable grant or trust for the benefit of the spouse and their descendants. Primary beneficiary is my spouse, and I fund it with a $12 million taxable gift. There's a gift tax exemption, so there's no gift tax on that. And then he sells $8 million of income-producing assets to the trust for a private annuity that pays him six fifty seven a year. So 20 million is in the trust and they retain 10 million. Okay. And the calculation of the annuity is now, interestingly enough, the IRS requ requires the trust to have reserves of a certain amount. In other words, insurance companies, when they issue commercial annuities, have to have minimum capital reserves of their own capital. So the same test applies to a trust that issues a private annuity. And that is a pure mechanical test in the regulations. They tell you exactly how to do it. And it says, if you're going to issue an $8 million annuity for someone age 62 with a 5% discount rate, you need 3.8 million of reserves. So in addition to, so the trust needs 3.8 million of reserves. But guess what? The trust has a $12 million seed gift. So it clearly meets the reserve requirement. All right. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay. And now remember, it's a grant or trust. So essentially, that means that all of the income on the 30 million, which we assume to be 7%, is reported by the grantor. So they have to report 
$2.1 million of income each year. Okay. But the income earned by the 20 million in the trust is 1.4 million and the income earned by the retained assets is 700,000. Okay. So because it's all grant or trust, regardless of who owns the income producing asset, the grantor has to pay all the income taxes on 2.1 million of income. All right. Now, for simplicity purposes, let's assume the property doesn't appreciate in value because we want to illustrate this slowly. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay. okay. H dies first. This trust is for the benefit of my spouse and my descendants. If H dies first, there's the 12 million gift. The $8 million annuity terminates. So the trust for the benefit of my spouse and my descendants has $20 million. H dies with $10 million. But there's no state tax on that $10 million. Because what H can do, now we assume that H fully utilized his entire gift tax exemption. So H has no more gift tax or estate tax exemption left for the $10 million that H has retained. But wait a minute, if H gives that $10 million to his surviving spouse, guess what? There's an unlimited marital deduction. And therefore that means when H dies, the marital deduction is a deduction. So the taxable estate that H has is zero. And now W has $10 million. But remember, W has W's full gift of estate tax exemption. So basically in that situation, W can do estate planning with the marital deduction bequest, or if W does nothing with it and just keeps the 10 million and has like a $6 million estate tax exemption because W dies when the exemption goes to half of what is now, all there is is an estate tax on $4 million. Not bad. Now, the problem is H is concerned what happens if my spouse dies first? Well, guess what, H? You still get your annuity for the rest of your life. And by the way, in that situation, if, you know, remember that the 10 million is owned jointly by H and W. So when, when, when we when we know when H knows that W is in poor health and is, is not going to make it, H can make a gift of the ten million dollars that he has to W. So when W dies with ten million dollars of assets, she can do it as a marital deduction bequest to H, and she hasn't used any of her gift tax exemption. So she can put, say, $6 million into the bypass trust, so H gets it, and all that's exposed to estate tax will be the $4 million. So what we're showing you here is you don't need two trusts in this situation for estates that have modest net worth. Now, if the clients have 40, 60 or $70 million, they both can make $12 million gifts. But we see with modest size estates under $30 million, they can't afford to make two $12 million gifts. And this is a private annuity for a healthy individual that we hope will live a long period of time. So there's no factual risk of you did it and died early. Okay. That's brilliant, Jerry. Let me ask you uh, what if these assets were held half by? H and half by W before the planning. What would you, do you know offhand what you would have done differently? Uh, I would tell you, I would basically be, the key, the key is as time goes by and one of the spouses uh, 
the health deteriorates, it's very rare that they'll die suddenly. Okay. Uh, and you, you could, but the, the point is whether the 10 million is held all by H or all by W or his own jointly, you have time to do pre-death planning with the retained assets. Okay, Treasurer, should we go ahead and launch another polling question? All right, once again, the answer is E for elephant. Jerry okay. Hesch is a, is a law professor, explained the law to President Ford, director of Notre Dame Tax Institute, drives a triumph, all of the above. You know, in the 52 years I've owned my Triumph car, I've never spent a dime on air conditioning repairs. <laughs> and why is that? It doesn't have air conditioning. <laughs> That's been great. Well, you've spent a lot of money on antiperspirant. <laughs> How are we doing, Treasurer? All right. So. Here's the estate view on private annuities, and I'm going to show you some flexibility here that you have. This is this is very important because all of the things that we describe in general terms, you can now illustrate it using ex numerical examples so that the client can see actually quantify all of the tax savings. Right, right. So here on the left, we're doing this in September. The 75-20 rate is 5%. The grantor will say is 64. You see a life expectancy of 20 years. Now, you Alan, let me ask you a very simple question. Someone age 64, according to the standard mortality tables of 2000, and these standard mortality tables are the 2010 census data. So. First of all, if you have a life expectancy at age 64 of uh, how many years? 20 years. All that means is there's a 50% probability you'll still be alive 20 years from now. So what you have to do is, and also the tables are 13 years old. So life expectancies have increased over the last 13 years. Secondly, the tables are based on the U.S. Census data of the entire U.S. population as a whole. And our clients are, tend to be healthier. So it's essentially, you can't run your projection out to life expectancy. You have to run it out to the, based on the assumption the individuals will live into the 90s. For example, Alan will show you What's the probability that someone age 65, when they reach age 90, will die? Uh, don't, don't, not sure where that is. <laughs> it's in your materials. I just saw it there. Uh, do, 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 right there. Probability of death. Oh, okay. Right on the very far right hand side. That's the exhaustion test. Exhaustion. No, year. but no, go down to the table. Okay. It's oh. at the oh, very yeah. right. You're right. Bottom right hand side. So essentially, someone age 66, you run it out 20 years, that's 86. The probability that they will die is. is at by age after age 90 is 4.2 percent so you always have to run your projections out to the 90s right now uh this oh, is, by the way does ahead. any of the commercial software when they run their projections ex extend it or do they all use life expectancy i think they all use life expectancy right All right, so this this is showing me twenty million dollars going into the trust. Uh, I'll go back to age sixty two, so it matches Jerry's hypothetical. The person puts in a twelve million dollar seed capital gift. 
sells eight million for an annuity, is uh, getting back uh, an annuity payment of six hundred fifty-seven thousand a year. Now, let me point out something. Okay. Because we use the standard mortality tables and the seventy-five twenty rate, it is assuming that the income-producing asset is only earning five percent a year. So it's actually earning 7% a year. The trust keeps the spread. Okay. Right. But I'm going to show you, even if the trust only earns 5% a year, without further planning, the, let me uh, move to two columns. Without further planning, if the trust only earns 5% a year, then the assets of the trust still go up um but because of the 12 million dollar gift that you made but when i go to the advanced well before i go to advanced jerry in the kite case mrs kite sold partnership interests in exchange for a private annuity and it didn't even start until the 10th year and she died well before the 10th year, so she never even got a payment back, but these assets were still out of her estate. So is it okay if I defer my first payment a few years? Well, you gotta give a little background in the Kite case, okay? There's a special rule in the regulations under the statute that say we can ignore the mortality tables if death is imminent and they define death as imminent is there is less than a 50 percent probability you will survive one year so what people do is when they want to do private annuity transactions is get a doctor's opinion and the doctor's opinion says there's more than a 50% probability the individual will survive more than one year. And then you fight with the IRS. It, what it, what's interesting enough, the IRS issued guidance in its regulations that the public is intended to rely on. And these regulations say that if you can show that there's a greater than 50% probability the individual will survive for more than one year, you can use the mortality tables even if they die early. And those, so what Mrs. Kite did was she sold, Mrs. Kite, death was not imminent, but Mrs. Kite was not in the greatest of health. And her doctor said, listen, Mrs. Kite has this, this, and that, but death isn't imminent. And it's clear from the facts and her medical records that she's in, she's in poor health, but death wasn't imminent. So they did a deferred annuity starting date five years from the date of the annuity. Mrs. Kite died at the end of three years. And the I, IRS said, we don't like this. We want to say you made a gift. And the I and the, the tax court had to come out and say to the IRS, you're bound by your own regulations. And since you weren't able to prove that death was imminent, the fact that she received no annuity payments is irrelevant because you are bound by your own regulations and and her records show that there was a more than a 50% probability she survived one year. So in the Kite case, they kind of hit a home run. Right. So just to show you real quick, you go to deferral period in the middle of the left-hand side. And if it's zero, then you start making annual payments at 657 a year. But if you want to defer payments the first five years like Mrs. Kite did, Click to five, and now you see the annuity payment would be a million five thousand a year. But to keep up with inflation, instead of equal annuity payments, 
you might want to use a graduated annuity payment. Maybe they should go up by 4% a year, in which event if you defer by five years, they'll start at 740. Or if you uh, go to another one and defer, you don't defer at all, then the payments will start at 439 and build up, for example, in year 20 to 925. So the computer does all this for you. Jerry, you've been doing this by longhand. <laughs> so we're going to retire your, your quill pen so that you can just see these answers in, uh, instantly. And then the other no, thing, I, go ahead. I used because I can always erase. Right, that's, that's true too. Uh, now we just have a delete key for that. Also, you could put you could use an LLC and a discount, go with a 25% uh, discount perhaps, and look how low that annuity payment gets with a 20% uh, discount. And then you're going to like and, this, Jerry. You can click on words, does the grantor pay the I have income a million dollar asset and I put it in an LLC and take a 20% discount. Then the annuity is not based on a million. The annuity is based on eight hundred thousand dollars of value so therefore the, the annuity payments will actually be somewhat less right right so then i'll remember this one then i'll go to annuity number four and jerry add in as a present for you showing what happens when the grantor pays the income tax on the trust and then you have the fourth to the right column the state tax savings from the burn and it's a lot you, when you look at how much the estate tax savings from the trust from the grantor having to pay the income tax on the trust my gosh it really it really piles up it's 3.4 million by age 95 that's a lot of additional estate tax savings and that's not the amount paid that's the estate tax savings so that's 40% so over uh over a 32 year period, over $8 million is paid in taxes because of the income of, the, of this trust, which reduces the estate of the grantor. Now, if anyone wants it, you can have a PowerPoint explaining all, you can have four PowerPoints here. I'll go ahead and save them before I forget. And then if anyone wants them, just let me know and I'll send them to you. Click planner's checklist, submit, they're all there. Uh, Jerry, we've got some questions. Go ahead. Let's take the questions. Yep. Or let me see. Did we do, did we do two of these? We have one more. Uh, let, let's do the one more polling question so that people can leave if they want to leave. We don't take that personally. Okay. The answer is all of the above under D. Jerry, what's special about this year's Notre Dame conference? Well, we have some very we have some very practical topics that are that really have nothing to do with saving estate taxes. Uh, they they, de they deal with practical considerations that always arise. Uh, uh, for example. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to uh, basically uh, deal with, uh, oh wait a minute here. Let me let me get the. Yeah, there's some very practical questions. Uh, like one of our ethics sessions is, you have a trustee in an irrevocable trust and you want to get rid of that trustee for one reason or another so one one of this one of these sessions uh is going ending the attorney client relationship without tears oh i'm sorry when you want to get rid of the client that you've done estate planning for okay how do you terminate that relationship where you basically for one reason or another, you don't want to represent the client anymore. And that's not easy to do. So that's a practical issue, okay? Then 
there, there's another session that interest rates have increased significantly. Remember, the, the 75 20 rate used to be 1 to 2 percent, it's now 5 percent. So, there are certain structures that worked unbelievably well when the 75 20 rate was low. They don't work as well with a higher 75 20 rate because remember, it's the spread. So it assumes you're earning income at 5%. And if you have an asset we're earning 6%, the spread you get is only 1%. When the interest rates were 1% or 2%, there was a bigger spread. But there are, remember, the 75 20 rate is a discount rate. And there are certain transactions that did not work well in a low interest rate environment that actually work much better in a higher interest rate environment. So we have a speaker who is going to basically talk about uh, strategies that work better with higher interest rates. Okay. Which is, you know, these are practical topics. Then we have another topic that's income tax planning. And that is everybody uses grantor trusts, but on Friday afternoon, I'm, I'm, bring, I'm bringing in Paul Lee at the very end on using installment sales to non-grantor trusts to defer the gain realized if you're going to sell an appreciated asset while you're alive. And so basically, you're not going to get step up in basis at death because you intend to sell the asset while you're alive. If you were going to have all this realized gain, how can you use related party installment sales to defer the reporting of that gain, even though it's going to be sold within a short period of time for cash? It's an income tax planning topic. Okay. Then there's another topic of all the states have different trust laws. And so we have another person talking about factors co to consider when choosing the jurisdiction for your trust. Again, it has nothing to do with saving estate taxes. It has to do with very practical concerns. And, and then there's another, another fact. Another thing is non-tax planning considerations when you want to pass the family business on to your descendants or you want to pass a portion of your family business on to key employees. Very practical concerns that we deal with. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I went through the questions. I think we've answered them all. Uh, the most common question we get is how do I use a state view? What does it cost? Right now it doesn't cost anything. You just go put put a stateview.link in your browser, tell it your email address is test at test.com, all small cap, all small print, tell it your password is test, log in, it's right there on the web. It works on Apple, it works on computers, it works on iPads, it even works on your cell phone somewhat. So enjoy. Uh, Jerry, I we're we're you know, done with the presentation, there's still a lot of people on, and I just wanted to go over the typical logistics for a large client who may want to do a grant or trust or an installment sale, private annuity. Um, anything you want to mention on skins and private annuities before I go into this, and you're welcome to stay, or if you have other stuff to do, you can go do it. Well, I, actually, one of the problems is an individual. Uh, says, I don't like the burn on grant or trust status. Okay. Now, if you're going to set up two different trusts, okay, uh, why not have one trust be a non grant or a trust and the other trust be a grant or a trust? For example, you can set up a grant or a trust for the benefit of your spouse and your descendants. And then you can set up a non grant or a trust for the benefit of your descendants. Therefore, you don't have to pay the income taxes 
on the income in the non-grantor trust. Another practical concern. Right, and when you when you draft these trusts, you need to make very sure that you can toggle off the grantor trust status so that the trust can pay its own taxes and that you can peel away parts of the trust. In other words, I may have a $100 million trust and the client says, well, I don't wanna pay all the taxes, I'll pay some of the taxes. Well, can I turn that into an $80 million trust where the client continues to pay the taxes and a $20 million trust that pays its own taxes? So you wanna have that ability to form sub-trusts to what we call decant, just like decanting a bottle of wine, you build a new bottle, you decant into it, and then as, as you can imagine, making sure that you have explained to the client their responsibility to pay the taxes and the repercussions of this. You get into one issue that I think, Jerry, you'll agree it's interesting and treacherous, and the trustee goes, well, I have the discretion to toggle off grant or trust status, but I'm not going to because I have a fiduciary duty to the family, not to the grantor. Yes, as a matter of fact, and that's under general trust law, when you, when, you, when you create a trust for the benefit of your descendants and you name a independent, you name a trust, any trustee, the under trust law that's adopted in every single state, the trustee has a duty of loyalty only to the beneficiaries. And all of a sudden, grantor says to the trustee, I'm tired of paying all the income taxes. I want the trust to pay the income taxes. And the trustee says, well, if the trust pays the income taxes, that means that the beneficiaries are going to receive less. And I can't do it because I have a duty of loyalty solely to the beneficiaries. Gulp, gulp. And there was a case in the Supreme Court of Minnesota, state case, where the grantor told the trustee to turn off grantor trust status. The trustee says, hey, the beneficiaries will sue me because I increased the expenses of the trust and I'm not going to do it. And, it, and, and the grantor sued the trustee and lost. Wow. Interesting. So that's why our trusts normally have trust protectors who are explicitly not fiduciaries, who explicitly have the right to do whatever it takes to toggle off grantor trust status. And most commonly, our only grantor trust status situation is the result of the ability of the grantor to exchange trust assets for assets of equal value and the grantor can release that power and has no fiduciary duty not to release the power then you have to go through the trust and make sure you don't inadvertently have any other grant or trust powers one of which would be if you have your spouse as the trustee of a slat but the grantor can replace your the spouse as trustee of the slat so certainly not a cakewalk. Let me go ahead and explain this chart as I promised. And can you make it bigger? Yeah, I'm gonna, oops, what did I do here? Let me find it. So just to tell you what it is before I make it bigger, you've got spouse one and his revocable trust. You've got spouse two, her revocable trust. You've got an irrevocable life insurance trust. And you have a spousal limited access trust and a descendants trust. So, right, so basically the, the trust in blue is for the benefit of my spouse and my descend, descendants. And the trust in purple is only for the benefit of my descendants. Right, right. So in green is an LLC. And let's say that before the planning, husband had 50 million of assets and wife had 25 million of assets and we wanna do this planning. 
Well, we'll commonly have the husband put 50 million into the green LLC, have the wife put 25 million into the green LLC. Now the husband owns 70, uh, I'm sorry, the husband owns two thirds of the LLC, 66%. The wife owns 33%. The LLC is divided into 1% voting, 99% non-voting. A few weeks or a couple of months later, you have to wait a certain period of time. The husband decides that he's going to sell his 66% non-voting member interest to a trust for the wife and descendants. So, which, which is a grant or a trust? Which is a grant or trust. So the husband signs an irrevocable trust agreement, and the spouse may be trustee or co-trustee, or an asset protection trust jurisdiction trustee may be co-trustee. If you want the ability for husband to be added to the trust later, which is a whole nother topic, husband then makes a seed capital gift to that spousal limited access trust and sells the 99% interest in the LLC to the spousal limited access trust for a promissory note or an annuity payment right. So the rule of thumb, it's not a rule, it's not required, but sort of the rule of thumb would be that let's say the LLC Wait, is work. Go ahead. Let me make this it. Would I? I have a trust that has one dollar in it. Okay, and I am going to sell to that trust a ten million dollar asset in return for the trust promissory note. In the real world, would you sell an asset? To somebody 100% seller financing if that person did not have some of their own assets? Never. Why? Because I may not get paid back. In other words, and so basically, in the real world, now remember, we want our estate planning transactions to replicate what would have done in the business world with independent third parties. So essentially in that situation, so what, if the trust has no asset, but the trust pledges all of its assets that it purchased as collateral for the $10 million note they issue to you, you think, you think you're good, but what happens if the property goes down in value, the trust walks away. So, it, so in the real world, we would want the trust to have its own assets. That's right. All right. So essentially, the state planners say, we want the trust to have its own assets. So you should make a gift of seed money to that trust. Now, given that we have two $12 million exempt gift tax exemptions, does it hurt for you to they use one of your gift tax exemptions and fund the trust with a $12 million taxable gift. Doesn't it, it, it may not hurt. It, it, it may be better just to use a 10% rule of thumb and keep as much of your exemption as you can in case the IRS challenges other stuff you're doing, such as taking discounts on the sale. Yeah. So the estate planning profession, uh, like certainty. So what developed is this 10% minimum funding myth that basically says, if you're gonna do an installment sale to the trust, it should have its own assets equal to 10% of what the promissory note is. And the state planners like it because they can say, hey, this is what you do. In the real world, it's, it's a facts and circumstances test. There is no 10% requirement in the Internal Revenue Code. But out of an excess of caution, you always would like the trust to have some of its own assets. 
Now, if it's an annuity, the exhaustion test gives you a specific dollar amount that the trust must have. In our example, it was like $3.8 million. So basically, you're always going to fund the trust with some of its own assets. Right. Okay. So mechanically, in, in this situation, the husband, as I said, he owns 66% of the LLC. 1% is owned by the husband, wife, and the grandchild trust that I'll explain later. 33% is owned by the wife. The husband sells his 66 and two thirds percent interest for the promissory note, whether it's a skin or conventional or part skin, part conventional to get to the interest rate that he would like to receive. The seed capital gift may consist of $10,000 placed in a Nevada bank account with a Nevada co-trustee. And in our example, 230, I'm sorry, $2.3 million into the hands of a trustee or into an LLC that may be managed by the client's spouse who is a beneficiary of the trust. She manages the LLC subject to a fiduciary duty. It's not her checkbook personally. It's to be managed from an investment standpoint. She should not take anything out of it without the consent of the trustees. But maybe the Nevada Trust Company will charge a little bit less if they don't have actual responsibility over anything beyond a $10,000 bank account. They'll just get an annual report that'll tell them what's happened with the LLC and confirm that nothing been, has been taken out of it. So now we've converted a significant portion of the husband's investment assets into a fixed payment, low interest promissory note under 4%, maybe locked in for his life expectancy, or somewhat more than that if it cancels on death. In addition, he is paying the income tax on the income earned by that trust. Now the note in my example will be more than 23 million. If he puts in 50 million into the LLC, the note will probably be about 70% of 50 million. So it'll probably be about a $35 million note. He's going to take a discount because a non-voting member interest in an LLC is not worth a pro rata portion of the assets of the LLC. Jerry, what's your elevator talk on discounts? Well, in interestingly enough, the IRS internally looks at all gift tax returns. Internally, you don't even know it. And that internal review is which of the gift tax returns we're actually going to audit, okay? And they don't have the ability to audit every single gift tax return. So essentially, they, they have the ability to audit maybe two thirds of the gift tax returns. And so most people take very aggressive discounts you put marketable securities into your LLC and take a 35 to 40% discount. That's on the high end. The IRS settles these cases. They offer to settle these cases for discounts ranging between 15 to 20%, sometimes 25%. So if you take a discount, say, of 20%, and every other gift tax return is taking a discount of 35% or more. What are the chances that the IRS is going to audit your gift tax return? Pretty darn low. Right. And the clients are telling you two things. One, I want to take advantage of everything that's possible to reduce 
the amount of wealth exposed to estate tax. At the same time, they're tacitly saying to you, and I don't want to get audited. And as a state view shows you, the size of the discount is a one-time thing that is the least important factor financially as for wealth shifting. The financial leverage, the freeze, and the grantor paying the income taxes all contribute far more to the wealth shift than the size of the discount. And so therefore, you can basically say to the client, hey, I can design a structure that will almost will reduce your audit exposure and it won't cost you that much. In other words, you could show using a state view the estate tax savings with a 35% discount and then compare the estate tax savings with a 20% discount. And you will see the other factors are so far more important that they say, why should I be aggressive on the discount when it's so insignificant? That's right. Well said. Okay, so that so the spousal limited access trust will not pay benefits to the spouse unless they're needed because everything in the spousal limited access trust is protected from estate tax and is protected from creditors and is protected if there's a divorce. In the event of a divorce, we design these trusts usually if it's funded with what we call marital assets. We fund this, we design this trust so if there's a divorce, half of this breaks into a trust for the spouse that the spouse decides who the trustee is going to be. The spouse retains the right to receive health, education, and maintenance benefits. The other half breaks into a trust still for that spouse and descendants, but the husband, in my example, retains the right to decide who the trustee is. And the trust protectors change on divorce. We have a provision that says in the unlikely event that we divorce, the trust protectors for husband's part will be Ernie and Floyd. The trust protectors for wife's part will be Nancy and Roger. So that this thing can, can divide in an appropriate way. Now, if this is a second marriage situation and the husband here came into the marriage with his own assets and he's doing this for his new spouse and descendants, then in the event of a divorce, the new spouse may just be out of the trust. Actually, if you wanna be very aggressive, never ever use the name of your spouse in your trust agreement. Always say for the benefit of my spouse. And then, in the obscure boilerplate definition provisions, which nobody reads, you have the definition of the spouse as the person who I'm currently legally married to at that time. Right. And when you sit down with the clients, Jerry, and you say, hey, Marsha, is it OK with you if you pass away that Alan's next wife will be a beneficiary of this slat so that he can get benefits if he needs them? You know what the answer usually is? Hell no. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what the answer usually is. <laughs> in, 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 in other words, there's a lot of technical things that you can do. And you have to really remember, in the real world, what is the practical reality of doing some of these things? Yeah. Because everything sounds great, but it might be impractical. Right. Now, in my example here, the wife owns one third of this LLC and we want to freeze her estate too. So we take her one third of a $75 million LLC, which is worth about 25 million. We take a 30% discount. So she has a note of about 70% of, of 25 million about 18 million. She makes a $1,800,000 seed capital gift to a trust for descendants. 
I don't know about you, Jerry, but I'm just not comfortable doing what they call reciprocal trusts, where I do a trust for Marsha, Marsha does a trust for me. The IRS may uncross it. The U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of U.S. v. Crace, said, well, if they're different enough, that's okay. I'm still concerned because my creditors can get into that trust and so can Marsha's creditors because of the reciprocal trust doctrine. So we normally say, you know what, if you're rich enough to do this stuff, then you shouldn't need every dollar to come back to you. Just have the wife's trust for descendants only. In, in other words, what Alan is saying is the, the slant takes care of your spouse. Why, re, re, why, why do these reciprocal trusts, which look like everything's the same, make it a descendants trust, you completely eliminate the exposure that the IRS fights these reciprocal trusts. Right, right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the joint ownership and the grandchild trust. Is so, that the one in orange? What's that? Is that the orange? Yes, right. Remember, you got your color coded, you might also use that. Yeah, yeah, thank you, that's a great pointer. So you see, we want the married couple to control the management of the LLC. They want to control it. So in the old days, we would have them own the 1% voting member interest or the 1% general partner interest in a limited partnership. And then we would sell or give away the 99% non-voting member interest or the 99% limited partnership interest. But the IRS came along and won two tax court cases. One was a tax court memorandum case years ago called Strangi, S-T-R-A-N-G-I, where the facts were very extreme, but the judge's opinion, and it was a judge, I think, Wendy Cohen, it was a well-drafted opinion that shocked us, or it shocked a lot of us, and it said, hey, if you give something away, but you even have the right to vote on what might happen, as to if and when there will ever be a liquidation or distribution relating to what you gave away, then it's still in your estate under Internal Revenue Code Section 2036A2. Well, wait a minute, Alan. Suppose, suppose I retain a right to make a decision as to the grandchildren's trust, but I can only make it in conjunction with an independent trustee. In other words, I have the, I can't, I really can't, I don't have any control. That's probably okay, as long as that, that moment problem? of death. Well, actually, no, that won't work because the, the statute says the, the uh, taxpayer in conjunction with any other person. So I can, I can basically have a limited, I can have the general partner in my partnership be, 99% owned by some by by the tr a trustee, and I have a 1% interest in the general partner, and that means that I'm ex the general partnership interest is exposed to estate tax. That's right. And that's what happened in Strangey and in Powell. the The general partner interest was owned by a company, and the person who died that in one of those cases only owned, I think, 49% of the company, the son-in-law owned 51%, and they point, those words are in that statute, in conjunction with. That's right. It's right there in the statute. Right in the statute. Nobody read it for 50 years, but Judge Cohen read it. Uh, so what we do is we set up a special voting interest of one tenth of one percent, we put it in a trust. We call it the grandchild trust. It's for future born grandchildren or present grandchildren. And then we make the trustee of that trust someone who is not involved with the rest of the estate plan, who is not a strict fiduciary of the client. Now, I, we accidentally left my name here when we sterilized this chart. But just another pointer for practitioners is. You know, I say, well, who do you want to be trustee of the grandchild trust? And the client says, oh, my cousin, Johnny. 
Okay, well, we need Johnny to get this witness and notarized. We need him to sign an acceptance. We need him to sign an SS4 to get a tax ID number. Uh, well, he's in Siberia for a few weeks, but I'm sure he'll get right back with you. So sometimes I'll just serve as trustee just to get it set up, and then I'll, I will resign a week later. I'll sign the trust agreement. I'll sign the SS4. I'll sign the sale agreement. I'll sign on the account. The client makes a small gift to the trust of enough for the trust to open up an account and make a contribution to that LLC to be a one-tenth of 1% 1 member. So in my example of a $75 million LLC, that's going to be a $7,500 contribution by the grandchild trust to the LLC. So the client's going to write an $8,500 check to me or whoever as trustee, I'm going to deposit it in the account, then I'm going to write a $7,500 check to the LLC. Now the LLC is worth $75,700,000. Uh, $75, and then the sale can take place. Jerry, any comments on that? No. Uh, by the way, the Grandchildren's Trust you know, when you think about it, the, the grandparents, you know, once the children have, you know, have uh, sat it, you know, have done their duty and have grandchildren, right. the grandchildren's trust becomes very important because really the grandparents are saying, I want to benefit my grandchildren. And that grandchildren's trust can also be funded with separate assets and what you know would be nice in that grandchildren's trust what's that to have them invest in income producing assets where the income isn't taxable can that be done is there a situ is, is there a situation where you can have a trust for the benefit of your grandchildren invest in income producing assets and the income isn't taxable if it is used for their education. 529, I, 529 college 529 savings. 529 plan. That's a good point. And what's, and what's interesting is, is if the grandparents want to fund that, and they can have, you know, for each grandchild, there's an annual exclusion, right? That's right. Uh, but but if, if I want to fund that with, five years of annual exclusions up front. Can I do that in a, if it's a 529 plan? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. In other, in other words, what is the best way to fund? We call these, we don't call them a grandchildren's trust. We call it an educational dynasty trust for the benefit of your descendants. Oh, I like that. I think we'll change to that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Right. And uh, by, by the way, if you over, a lot of people only put the annual exclusion amounts in their 529 plan, but if they want to put more money in, all they have to do is the excess use their gift tax exemption. Well, the other thing is that the SLAT could buy the 529 plans. The Descendants Trust can buy the 529 plans. So you could just immediately, even if you have one grandchild, you could just, if you have a slab or you have a descendants trust, you can use that seed capital gift to buy the 529 plan if you want. Exactly. And by the way, when you have income in a grantor trust that isn't taxable, that eliminates the burn. That's right. That's and, right. And, and one of the things that we do for existing estate plans, where the client after five, six, 10 years comes by and says, I'm tired of paying all these damn income taxes on the grant or trust income. I want, I, I want to eliminate it. Well, and then the, and you say you can't turn off grant or trust status, but then, so the trust invests its income producing assets in 529 plans. So the income isn't taxable. Right. And another thing to make sure you put in your drafting, is that the trustees have the authority to put trust assets into charitable remainder unit trusts 
because a charitable remain, a flip NIMCRUT, which is a special kind of charitable remainder unit trust, can receive assets, sell them almost immediately upon receipt, and then let those assets cook for up to 20 years and then pay them out in years, usually 15 through 20 to get the best economic result and defer the tax until then. And by then, maybe the grantor is deceased and doesn't have to worry about paying the tax. Or what, 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 Alan, what Alan is saying here is what, once you have you, you, your estate plan in place, is how can we use certain trusts or, or variations of certain trusts to defer the reporting of the income? That's and Alan just mentioned something called a NIMCRUT, which is an acronym and it's far beyond, far beyond the scope of what we could explain today. But, but remember that Estate planning is only part of the equation. Another part of the equation is how can I have income that is not going to be subject to income tax? And how, if I have income or gain, future gains, how can I defer the reporting for income tax purposes of that future income? These right. all have to be integrated into an estate plan. Absolutely. Now, the only other piece here of the estate plan, well, there's a couple other pieces, but they asked me, what do we do with our future income? How do we save our future income estate tax efficiently? And I said, well, why don't you form a new LLC that's going to be owned half by husband's revocable trust, half by wife's revocable trust, put your future savings in there, and then in two or three years, when it hits five or seven million or 10 million, we'll have you sell that 99% non voting member interest to the SLAT. I'm sorry, 49.5% non voting member interest to the SLAT, 49.5% non voting member interest to the Descendants Trust, and then we'll merge it into the green LLC. So, now, Alan, let me ask you a question. In your initial client meetings with the client, should you give them all of this at once? Only if you never want to see them again. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do it step by step, a little bit at a time. Don't try to overwhelm them to show them everything that you can do. Start with the basics and go from there. Right. I mean, it really, you start with the slat, and then if they understand the slat, you allude to the installment sale and try to see if they understand it or not. If you're not sure, say, this is really complicated. I don't expect you to understand it. We can go over it later. But then if you do, just draw it out on a pencil and pad in front of them. It may take three or four meetings before they have a good understanding of it, but almost any client can understand these concepts. It's just I tell the client, you know, it's like taking a college course. It is a 30 hour investment if you want to understand it, but it addresses the most prominent financial threat to your family's well being, the federal estate tax. You've spent 50 years putting together this 50, 60 million dollar fortune. Uncle Sam's ready to take 20 million when you die. Is it worth taking a college course? Is it worth spending some money? And you know, usually, usually that makes the point. For a lot of clients, is not it's not as important as getting their kids to aftercare program. It's not as important as a vacation. But certainly to the children, what we're doing is very important. So the communications on that is something to develop along with your technical skills. All right. Well, Alan. It's like the key, the key is don't do everything at once. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to, so Jerry, I think we're set. We still have some attendees. The only thing I, I 
promise that I didn't deliver. Two things. Uh, one is a very brief overview of a state view for people who don't know what it is. Uh, again, it's free right now. It's just in the beta test stage. Uh, but the main module here allows you to enter data on the left-hand side and then click on the right-hand side to show different planning scenarios. So for example, as you see in the middle, I've got Peter and Mary Jones, they've got a $3 million house, they've got investments of $30 million. Their house is growing at 4.78%, which is probably way higher than we should show. Investments at 7.23%, minus some investment fees and taxes. And uh, Peter dies in, in year 11, Mary dies in year 19, and all these variables can be changed. You can provide how much of their exemption they have left, whether they already have a trust funded for their descendants, how long each of them will live, whether the exemption amount's going to half in 2026, whether, port whether portability will apply, whether they will do a qualified personal residence trust, et cetera, et cetera. So when I click on current estate no planning at the top right, I so show them here's what will happen if you die on your way to vacation, because they always want to know that. And then I show them if you do no planning in 19 years, 24 million in tax, if you let us fund a credit shelter trust on the first death, the trust, the tax will go down. If you let us do a qualified personal residence trust and it works, then the tax will go down uh, more. If we do annual gifting, and let me go ahead and click what I need to click here to have all these devices work. So uh, no planning. Credit Shelter Trust, Qualified Personal Residence Trust, Annual Gifting, disc, disc, Gifting of Discounted LLC Interests, Using Life Insurance Trusts, Using an Installment Sale, in, whether for a skin or conventional. And then this is what's new. If you've used a state view, then you know, you know that the Cupert is new. We haven't had the Cupert in this uh, area of the software before. And then the other thing I'm really learning from is the charitable testamentary. So you say, well, here's 65 million going to your children, 20 million to estate tax. Would you just rather give it to charity so there's no estate tax? And a lot of clients say yes, not realizing that although that eliminates the estate tax. The children go from 64 million to uh, less than than 60. I mean, I'm sorry. They go from 83 million to 80 million for charity to get five million. So to save two million of estate tax, your children are losing four million of ass or five million. Have four million of assets for charity to get five million. Now, that can go to a foundation that can benefit your children or to a CLAT. So I click on CLAT. I tell the computer that I'm going to have 60% go to charity over time, a uh, 20 year CLAT. So now I can show them that what this looks like, that it would be. 79 million to the children on death, but then another 2 million 20 years later. 5 million one to the CLAT, but another 2 million to the, ch to the children. So that's a new feature. The click here, generate client letter. You can select what scenarios you wanna show, and then it will generate a comprehensive uh, letter. And also now when you click generate client letter, while it is preparing the letter, it tells you what the major assumptions and results are. Uh, it does talk. I'm not gonna use that right now because it, it takes some, some time. 
Then the other nice new feature we have is share with client. I say, you know, I want my client to understand this. I'll shoot a 10 minute Zoom call explaining it, and then I'll click share with client. It assigns me a code number. I click URL. I click copy to clipboard. Now I go to an email and I click on this and it gives the client a link and the client's uh, data is on here. The client cannot change their age, the number of clients, or the name you put on the program because I don't want the clients to go practice law for their friends, but it does give them uh, 12 days to, to use this on their own. So that's the uh, that's the main module. Jerry, any questions on that? There's a lot there, Alan. There's a lot there. Yeah. There is a lot um, there. But the, the point is, it's all designed to ac economize what you were doing and then illustrate it in an understandable manner. And with, and without without the numerical examples, it becomes very different. That's right. All right, so Jerry, we're going to sign off now. I can't thank you enough for all your leadership and and everything you've done for this profession and for us, and everything you're going to continue to do. Thank you sincerely to the 140. Uh, people who made it all the way to here so that I can tell you my favorite Jimmy Buffett albums and my recommendations for Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett was not only a very talented musician and songwriter, which was his first love, but he was also a very good writer. He was one of the few individuals to make the New York Times bestseller list in three categories. Number one in fiction, Where is Joe Merchant? A great, great James Bond style adventure tale. Number one in nonfiction, A Pirate Looks at 50, a hilarious and very insightful autobiography. And number one in children's books, and I don't recall the name of the children's book, but it, he does have or did write a lovely children's book. In addition to that, According to one Wall Street Journal article, he had over 5,000 full-time employees in his organization's net worth, probably over a billion, running his Margaritaville restaurants. And friends of mine from high school now live in a Margaritaville development, a theme development in Florida. So very, very interesting, very astute individual. He ranked up there with the Grateful Dead. They were the number one and two top grossing touring bands in the world, many years on end. In addition to that, when Marsha and I saw him the first time at a uh, benefit in New York in, I think, 1996, he got up, he went after Paul Simon. And he got up and he said, hey, they told us we could only play two hit songs. That's easy for me. I've only had two hit songs. So his two hit songs were Come Monday, which put him on the map initially, and Wasting Away in Margaritaville. But those of us who have listened to many of his albums know that he has a lot of very good songs. So. My first recommendation, if you don't know Jimmy Buffett, would be to listen to his double album, You Had to Be There, because you did have to be there. And what I really like about this album is it took his greatest songs from the beginning until when he recorded it live at the Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, a very Southern place for a very Southern guy. And between each song, he tells beautiful stories. Some of these stories, two to three minutes, he tells about his grandfather, he tells about his marriages, 
He talks about how he likes Saturday Night Live. And you see that his concerts were not just concerts, they were parties. He was He's very upbeat. And another thing I really like about this album is his harmonica player, Fingers Taylor, was with him in this live performance and on every album up until this live performance. And then after that, they broke up. And much to my chagrin, my biggest regret about Jimmy Buffett is he didn't have harmonicas after that. He had saxophones. And I like saxophones, but the Fingers Taylor harmonica and the fact that these two guys went together, acoustic guitar, in an old car, and went from city to city performing wherever they could uh, is, you know, an interesting story. Now, on albums, the best early album is A1A. He did not make it in Nashville. He failed in Nashville. I am one of the few owners of his initial album, which no one bought, and I don't think it's very good. But that was his initial album. But it does have the song, The Captain and the Kid, which was one of his favorite songs. But then he moved down to Key West and he really got that Key West vibe. Back then, Key West was not an upscale place. It was more of a New Orleans French Quarter situation, run down stuff, drunken people walking around. So uh, he, wrote that album A1A. And if you ever drive to the Florida Keys and you've got a four hour drive or a three hour drive from Miami to the Florida to, to Key West, you want to listen to the A1A album. It's very humorous. He has a parody of Let's Make a Deal. He has a song called The Great Filling Station Hold Up, which is a very interesting, all upbeat. And the song Trying to Reason with the Hurricane Season is also another good song on that album. Uh, I believe that after that came Havana Daydreaming, uh, one of my favorite pictures of Jimmy Buffett. He was a wild man. He did encourage uh, recreational drugs, which is not a good thing, but he did in his concert days. But one of my favorite songs on this album is My Head Hurts, My Feet Stinks, and I Don't Love Jesus. Yep. Sorry if that offends anyone, but it was one of his more popular songs. Then uh, Jimmy Buffett, Son and Son, Son of a Son of a Sailor, brought one of his very best songs, Pirate Looks at 40. Also, Cheeseburger in Para Paradise and Son of a Son of a Sailor, which was also in my mind a hit, but didn't go so far financially. Uh, then a great album, the Volcano album. You heard the song Volcano, but, and by the way, the lyrics are there in the sleeve. So you wanna watch those lyrics. They're very good. But Marsh and I's favorite song on the Volcano album was the song Survive. So it's worth the, the cost of admission to ask your phone to play the song Survive, and also the song Boat Drinks. Uh, lately, newspapers mention cheap airfare. I've got to fly to Saint somewhere. I'm close to bodily harm. 20 degrees and the hockey game's on. Nobody cares. They're way too far gone singing Boat Drinks, something to keep them all warm. This morning, I shot six holes in my freezer. I think I've got cabin fever. Somebody sound the alarm. He was just a very, very good writer. The songs are all sung slow enough that you can understand the words fast enough that they are very pleasant. The uh, Fruitcakes album was also a very good album. The song Fruitcakes was almost a follow-up to the John Lennon song, Imagine. If you like the John Lennon, so Lennon song, Imagine, you probably will like the song Fruitcakes by Jimmy Buffett. And then the Florida Days album ca caught Florida uh, pretty well. So I want to thank Jimmy Buffett for making my college years and my law school years much more pleasant than they would have been. Uh, 
going to his concerts and listening to his music with friends was a a great great thing and and by the way back then as as many of you remember there was no internet you would either listen to the radio station and hope they might play a song you liked or you would go and buy the album so this was a big part of my net worth back then and now it's a big part of what makes life worth living welcome your questions comments and suggestions on anything that we've talked to today about today thanks again to jerry hash a great friend a great mentor a very giving and very intelligent professor the rest of you thank you so much for attending thanks for your feedback have a wonderful rest of a wonderful three-day weekend and i hope i see at least five of you at skipper's smokehouse at well, I'm going to get there at five o'clock and start hanging out with some friends. Will Johns, the nephew of Eric Clapton, with his band, goes on at 7 p.m. Have a terrific, terrific day. Thank you. Okay, Alan. Take All care. right, Terry. Thanks again.